Good morning. Glorious is the day that God has given us, even when it's cloudy and overcast and pouring down rain as I drive over here. At least it has cleared for now. Welcome to worship, both those of you who are here in the sanctuary with us and those who are joining us online as well. Um, we are recognizing our high school graduate this morning uh, later in uh, worship, so we look forward to that. And um, we have a very interesting high school graduate. He's got a lot of gifts and skills. He's going to do some good work out there in the world. So I look forward to um, sharing that with you and getting to know you, Patrick, a little bit better as time goes on as well. Uh, we are um, still, if you are interested in learning more about the Presbyterian Church or about McGregor in particular or in joining the church, um, catch up with me today if you would. We're eager to get those who are interested um, joined um, here at McGregor. So if you know someone or if you yourself are interested um, please let me know about that um, just to keep you posted on staff and wh what we're doing and where we are karen coward you know is on vacation um, returning to the office on tuesday um, she and i will both be out of the office on thursday of this week attending a workshop at eastminster on suicide prevention uh, that's being offered to clergy and other church leaders and then joy will be away next sunday um, when was the last Sunday you had off, I wonder? <laughs> it's been a while. So we certainly hope that you and Bill have a relaxing time away. And we will look it's forward to you being back. It's a work vacation. It's, oh, well, that's not fun. <laughs> it's a good work vacation. A good work vacation. It's, 
Next weekend? I thought you were in Charleston. Oh, in Charleston, that's fine. I'm sorry. That's late. Oh, that's late. You're, you're ready to go to one treat. I gotcha. <laughs> well, we hope, even if it's work next week, I thought it was fun next weekend. We'll have fun working. How about that? Um, our preschool um, ends, uh, closes for the year, not closes, but their, their year ends this week. The four-year-old graduation will be here on Wednesday, and the three-year-olds have a see you later alligator um, event on Friday out on the lawn. So I would, you know, it continues to be tough for teachers and for um, Chris, the director, and so as they wind down, just I would just ask you to keep them in your prayers because um, it's also sad, as, as eager as they are for the end of the year, it's sad when they have to say goodbye to their kids. So um, just, I would ask that you keep them in prayer this week. Um, thank you to those who were able to attend yesterday's memorial service for Larry Bailey, who was a charter member here at McGregor. Um, that was certainly, um, uh, his daughter Julia had hoped that her parents would send some breezes through since it was outside on a hot day, and indeed that happened. So we were grateful to gather together and celebrate his life. Um, in a different vein, thank you to those who helped out with the Adopt a Highway um, yesterday. I know that takes getting up early on a Saturday morning to get out and go collect trash. So um, thank you for participating in that as well. All right, mark your calendars, put it in your head, put it in your phone. Summer worship begins in two weeks, so that's June 5th. Worship will move to 10 o'clock, um, and that will continue through the summer. That Sunday is also Pentecost Sunday. It's one of my favorite Sundays of the year when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. Um, we'll be having worship outside on the lawn, followed by a covered dish, or a picnic, depending on your comfort level. We know not everybody is ready to participate in a covered dish. Um, so if you're not, we don't want you to miss out on the fellowship. Bring your own picnic. Um, that'll be fine. So either way you want to do that, bring a dish to share or bring your own picnic. Um, and also wear red or orange or yellow if you don't have red. Um, fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so we invite you to wear those colors as we gather together. Um, I'm sure there are both Gamecock and Clemson fans here. There's got to be plenty of at least garnet and orange. Um, but we do look forward to that service. And again, if you'll just mark that wherever it is helpful for you to remember that. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God with a moment of silent centering prayer. Please rise and body your spirit for the call to worship. May God be gracious and shine upon us that all may know God's way. Let, Let the, the peoples, peoples praise you, O God. God. Let, Let all, all the peoples, peoples praise you. you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge with equity and guide us all. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. God, our God, has blessed us. Let all the earth revere God's holy name. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you.
Let us now join in the prayer that is printed in your bulletin. Loving God, we confess we are an anxious people. Our faith so often happens in fits and starts, rather than with a decisive, clear response. We deny the blessings you offer us and fail to heed the guidance of your Spirit. Forgive us, we pray, for these and all our sins. Lead us to lives of peace, reflecting your love in the world. Amen. Friends, let our hearts in these moments be still and know that God is a God who loves us and forgives us again and again as we seek to be drawn closer to God's heart. Receive the peace of Christ and trust and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. together. Do you think you'd have to have? 
You think 20 would do it? 2,000. Maybe 2,000. I think that's closer. I think it would take lots and lots of shells. And because it took lots and lots of shells, guess what? Purple cloth was really, really expensive because it was really hard to make. So we know that Lydia, if this is the kind of cloth that she worked with, she probably was pretty well off. And it was unusual for a woman back then to be a businesswoman, but she probably did that. Well, Paul came to where she was and told her about Jesus, and she wanted to be baptized. So here's a really cool thing about this. Did you know that a shell is a symbol for baptism? No. No? Well, you do now. Baptism is, a shell is a sign for baptism because you can scoop up some water, right? Shells come from the sea, from the water. So that's kind of why we think about baptism when we think about shells. So this woman who worked with shells to create her purple cloth really wanted to know about Jesus and was baptized. And so shells became a new symbol for her. And that meant about her participating, being part of God's church. And so she did. After Paul had told her about Jesus, you know what she did? She didn't say, well, thanks, bye. She said, how about you come to my house for dinner? Why don't you stay with me? And because she probably had a lot of money, she was able to help Paul and his friends and help found a whole church in that town where she was. So that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Yes. All right, so when you think about, when you remember purple cloth, you know, we can just go buy it at the store, right? She had to make it, and it took a lot of effort. Sometimes when we're following Jesus, it takes a lot of effort on our part, too. But so she was able to change all of her focus to doing something for God. I think that's what God wants us to do, too. When we make choices and do things in our lives, do things that, that make God happy. Can you try to do that this week? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. You don't look terribly sure about that. Yeah. yeah. All right, so next week I want you to tell me what you did to make God happy this week, okay? Well, I want you to think about it. When you go through your week, think about it. And maybe you'll think of something and go, wow, I bet God really liked that. Like maybe if you help out at home without being asked. Do you ever do that? <laughs> you have to be asked. So maybe this week do it without being asked. I think that would be bad. Or I think my bed Without being asked? That is impressive. Keep it up. That's good. That's good stuff. All by yourself. Very good. That's a good thing to do. Let's have a you do that too? Do you do it every day? Nope. I tried to. Let's pray together. I'll say a little bit and you'll all repeat, okay? Dear God, we thank you for shells. We thank you for baptism. Thank you for making us part of your church. And help us to do things that make you happy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right. And you all can go to Children's Church if you would like to. You're going to go that way with Miss Katrina. Will you come see me after church and we'll talk about it, okay? Well, are you going to go to Children's Church? Please join me in prayer. Holy God, as we hear your word read to us this day, open our hearts to the fresh wind of your spirit, bringing life and newness to this time. Then open our lives to serve you and our neighbors with glad and generous hearts. Amen. The first scripture lesson is from Book of John, chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. Jesus answered him, 
Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away. And I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. Our second scripture. Off on. Let's try that. That's better. Our second scripture this morning comes to us again from Acts. Last week, you might remember that we heard the story or the the summary of the story of Peter being sent to Cornelius. Um, both Peter and Cornelius receiving a vision, and that being the extension of the gospel to the Gentiles. And now we hear of a, a second story, another conversion story, another vision story that we hear from Acts chapter 16. I'm going to back up and start us at verse 6 instead of verse 11. So if you're following along in the what's printed in the bulletin, I'll, I'll catch up with you. Um, but I'm going to back us up a little bit. So this is when Paul is beginning his second missionary journey. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. 
There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I prayed over this passage from Acts this week, contemplating yet another vision story, yet another conversion story, the expansion of the gospel now finding its way all the way to Europe, and the new beginning that was marked by this story, what struck me most were the words, we set sail. And then the detailed description of the path that they took to get to Philippi, from Troas, a straight course to Samothrace, then to Neapolis, and finally to Philippi, which sounds like a rather comprehensive journey, but when you look on a map, it's pretty much a straight shot across the northeast corner of the Aegean Sea. So as I thought about Paul and company setting sail, heeding the vision that Paul had received of a man pleading with him, come to Macedonia and help us. It called to mind for me a book written by one of our former moderators of our denomination, Joan Gray. Her book is called Sailboat Church and is intended to help churches rethink their mission and their practices. She writes, early Christian symbols include a boat as a symbol for the church. In Jesus' time, there were two ways to power a boat on open water. One was to use muscles, most commonly by rowing. The other way was to harness the power of the wind. When the early Christians used a boat as a symbol for the church, it was never a rowboat. It was always a sailboat. She explains that this is because on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given and it came like a sound, like the rush of a violent wind. And it is that wind, that spirit that empowers us and sends us out to be the church. And yet, she notes, there are an awful lot of rowboat churches. She goes on to discuss the differences between a rowboat church and a sailboat church and saying while they may look alike on the surface, in many ways, the difference is in the attitude of its members and its leaders. The rowboat church focuses on its circumstances, believes and acts as if it progress its progress depends on its own strength, its own wisdom, its own resources. For the rowboat church, it's all about how long, how hard, and how well people are willing to row. And as I read that, I am mindful that for the last two years, clergy and lay people both have been rowing long hours, rowing hard and doing the best we can, though not always succeeding, doing the best we can to row well sometimes frustrated, even growing resentful that others don't seem to be willing to row as hard as we are. And the reality is, maybe those folks were rowing just as frantically in other areas of their life, not so much the church. Remember last week, our mission co-worker said, we've all been through the same storm, but we haven't all been in the same boat. I don't think there is anyone coming out of this pandemic unscathed, and we are only just beginning 
to understand the effects of that. And many of those effects will continue to ripple out and reveal themselves to us over time. Still, many of us are tired of rowing, and with good reason. Rowing is hard work. Sailboat Church, however, was written before the pandemic, and many of us were rowing hard even then, believing that if we just rowed harder or faster, things would get better. More people would come to church or serve on committees. We believe that by rowing harder, we can and should be able to fix it, whatever it is, and have been disappointed when that hasn't happened. And mind you, this was pre-pandemic. The last two years have only exacerbated this. But you get the problem with this line of thinking, right? It puts all the focus, all the energy, all the expectation on us as if God has just left us alone to do the work of the church, as if the church is simply another human institution limited by human resources and nothing more. So when those resources, be they money or time or energy or people, when those resources run out, people quit. They give up. And in an increasing number of cases, churches are closing their doors. It's rather disheartening. And quite the opposite of what we read about in Acts, as the church is just getting started and the gospel is exploding. It's interesting, isn't it? Where, where I began this morning, multiple times, Paul wanted to or tried to go several different places, but they were, we told, forbidden by the Spirit. The Spirit did not allow it to happen. Now, we're not told what that looked like, the Spirit forbidding them, and I suspect it's sort of an interpretation of what happened when someone looked back. Isn't that often how we see the hand of God at work in our lives, in hindsight? I mean, it could have been as simple as part of their crew got sick, and so they couldn't go. Or the rudder on their ship broke and they had to wait for it to get fixed. Or the road they had planned to travel got washed out by a storm. However it happened, they were stymied in their attempts to go where they wanted or where they thought they should go. It seems they were perhaps trying to row too hard on their own power, by their own assumptions or plans, and the spirit wasn't having it. And then, after Paul received a vision, the group determined, were convinced, we're told, that God was calling them to proclaim the good news in Macedonia. They then set sail, and by all accounts, it was smooth sailing all the way. Which doesn't mean, of course, <laughs> that Paul and company just kicked back and did nothing. That's not how sailing works. There is work involved in sailing, but it's a different kind of work than rowing. Sailors have to know when to hoist and shift the sails, when to let it all out, and when to pull them in. Harnessing the power of the wind, partnering with the wind to move the sailboat forward. And it seems as soon as Paul partnered with the Holy Spirit, he was off and running or sailing, as the case may be. Through that partnering together, a marvelous thing happened, didn't it? In Philippi, they found not a man pleading for help, but a group of women who had gathered by the river outside the city in a place of prayer. The indication is that there were not enough Jewish people to have a synagogue in the city, so they had to gather outside. And among them, we find Lydia, who seems to have been a successful businesswoman in her own right, as it read, a dealer in purple cloth, something only the wealthy and well-to-do would have been able to purchase and wear. It is of note that there is no mention in this story of a husband or of a son. Lydia seems to be managing just fine on her own, which would have been extremely rare in those days. And yet, as successful and independent as she may have been, 
It seems she knows there is something missing still in her life, a spiritual emptiness. And so she listened eagerly. The Lord opened her heart, we're told, to what Paul had to say. She and her household were baptized, and having opened her heart to the gospel, she now opens her home to Paul and his companions. And there we have it, the first baptism on European soil. You know, it was not so long ago that we stood before the cross on Good Friday, and all seemed lost. All seem to have come to an end, and yet here we are, the sixth Sunday of Easter, and not only has life defeated death, not only has Christ been raised to new life, but as we follow the lectionary, the gospel is spreading like wildfire, which makes sense, seeing as how it was driven by the Holy Spirit. We heard from John's gospel this morning, Jesus promising this Holy Spirit, the Advocate, to come alongside us and teach us everything and remind us of all that Jesus said to us. And here in Acts, we are given a clear example of what that looks like. As the Spirit guides, directs, leads Paul and his crew to Macedonia. And the same will be true, is true, for us, the church now. But we got to be willing to put down our oars, to quit thinking that if we just work harder and harder, things will change. No, we'll just get more tired and frustrated. I think now more than ever is the time for the church to claim its identity as a sailboat church so that we might harness the power of the wind of the Holy Spirit to blow in us and through us and move us forward, which sounds great. But how do we do that exactly? <laughs> That's the question, right? And I wish, I wish I had all the answers. I don't, <laughs> but we do have a guide. First, like Paul, we have to set aside our own plans, our own agendas. We need to remember that God has not just left us to it but rather has sent the Holy Spirit to teach us, to remind us who we are and whose we are, to guide us and refresh us. We have to believe, truly believe that God's power, God's Spirit is at work among us and in our community. So partnering with God doesn't mean us telling God our plans and our desires, it means being curious about what God is up to around us. How God is inviting us into a partnership, a mission, a purpose. Sometimes I think we're so tied to the idea that church looks like showing up to a building on Sunday morning. The worship service looking and sounding a certain way, committees meeting to plan and carry out ideas and sometimes showing up to participate in events and activities and studies that strike our interest. We are so tied to this particular image of church that even as it seems to be in decline, and even when it doesn't seem to be life-giving any longer, we continue to just keep at it. Even when it feels like all we're doing is batting our heads up against it. Maybe, just maybe, the Spirit is trying to tell us something different, trying to send us in a different direction. Maybe we've become too comfortable just coming and sitting in the boat, when the purpose all along has always been to set sail, to be empowered, to follow Christ in our daily living. Maybe it's time for a new vision, or better yet, a renewed vision of what it is to be disciples, followers of Christ, the one who was crucified and risen. When Paul had his vision, he then shared it with his companions, and together 
they discerned and were convinced that God was calling them to go and proclaim the good news to Macedonia. And note that as far as visions go, this one was pretty ordinary. Not a heavenly messenger like Cornelius had last week, not a thundering voice from heaven as is often reported in scripture, but a man, an ordinary human being pleading Paul to come and help us. How did they know? How do we know when it's God calling us to do something or when it's just our own ideas or even imaginings? Well, the truth is, I don't know that we're ever 100% sure. But we start by asking questions like, is this something that a follower of Christ would be asked to do? Is this in line with God's desires and purposes for the world? Those answers may not come quickly or clearly, but they do come. They come through prayer and waiting and the study of scripture and discernment in community. Paul didn't just say, hey, I think we should go to Macedonia. The language is we. We were convinced that God was calling us. And I guess one way that we know, one way such a vision is confirmed, is by the fruit that it bears for God's kingdom. In Philippi, they met Lydia, who was eager, hungry for spiritual food, for the gospel, and who was ripe for receiving it. And the beautiful thing is, they didn't just preach and baptize and walk away. Lydia and her household became part of what God was up to there in Philippi. Eventually, a strong church was built there. So in Lydia, we are given the reminder that ministry needs support to grow and thrive, that we all have a part to play, we all have gifts to share. It can't rest on the shoulders of just a few. And... Those few who are heavily invested have to be willing to share the load, the joys and the trials that it is to be involved in the mission and ministry of the church. So I wonder, are you tired of rowing yet? What would it take for you, for this church, to put down its oars and send up its sails instead? What vision might God be giving this church in this new day and time that would convince you to trust the Holy Spirit and set sail toward that new horizon? How might we partner with God, harness the power of the Holy Spirit, and be a force for good, a force for God's kingdom in a tangible way in our daily living as individuals and as a body? Exploring those questions will take time and prayer. It will take study and conversation. It will take discernment and not just a little amount of faith. The wind is shifting. I believe that wholeheartedly. Shall we? Dare we put down our oars, quit rowing, and instead focus our energies on setting sail? I'm convinced that if we do, we'll be in for a pretty amazing ride. Thanks be to God. Amen.
You may be seated. And let us affirm what we believe using the words printed in the bulletin. God, the Holy Spirit, fulfills the work of reconciliation in human life. The Holy Spirit creates and renews the church as the community in which people are reconciled to God and to one another. The Spirit enables people to receive forgiveness as they forgive one another and to enjoy the peace of God as they make peace among themselves. In spite of their sin, the Spirit gives people power to become representatives of Jesus Christ and his gospel of reconciliation to all. This time I would invite Patrick McGuire to come forward and share a few moments with me up front. Patrick is going to graduate going to graduate June 3rd from Spring Hill High School. You're going to have to correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, he is a member of the National Technical Honor Society and qualified to represent Kate Center at the 2022 National Technology Student Association in video production. Patrick is also an Eagle Scout, and his plans this summer include, get this, hiking 70 miles in 10 days. <laughs> More power to you. In New Mexico, where it's hot. <laughs> More power to you, for sure. Um, again, Patrick, we certainly wish you God's blessings. I didn't bring my bag with me. Hang on. I do have a gift on behalf of the Congregational Care Committee and your church family um, to wish you well, to wrap you in God's love, um, to remind you that we're still here and we'll certainly be cheering you on and eager to hear what you have in store for you going forward. Um, in Jeremiah, God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and a future, and I trust that that will be true um, for you as well. Let's have a prayer together. Holy God, we thank you for Patrick. We thank you for all the work that he has put in through all these many years of school and for all that you have before him. Keep him safe as he travels this summer, as he hikes, as he explores the beauty of your world. Remind him, O oh Lord, that you hold him in the palm of your hand and will be with him always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Congratulations to you. I look forward to hearing more about what you do. And Mom and Dad, congratulations to you as well. <laughs> Friends, God has indeed blessed us, blessed us with the joys of graduation, blessed us, more importantly though, through the waters of our baptism, through opening our hearts to the living word of Christ and in countless ways across our lives. We invite you to leave your offering this morning in the offering plates as you find them in the back of the sanctuary, or you may give through our website or by mailing your check directly to the church. Let us come before God with praise and thanksgiving offering our gifts as we return them to the Lord. Worship God is good. Let us go before God now in prayer. Holy God, we come before you bringing the prayers of our hearts, grateful for your goodness in our lives. We pray nurture our souls and open us to hear your words so that we might listen eagerly as Lydia did, and respond fully and clearly with hospitality and welcome. 
Send your spirit to blow through us and around us, directing our paths and guiding us on our way. We offer this day our prayers for the world, for your world, and for those who live in it. For places torn apart by war, by division, by hatred. For the peoples of Ukraine. For the peoples of Palestine and Israel. For neighbors around the globe who cannot seem to live together in peace. Renew us, we pray, in the face of your earth. O oh God, we long for an end to injustices everywhere, to racism, to poverty, to exclusion, to oppression. There is so much to overwhelm and discourage us. So stir in us your hope, your gladness, your vibrant life that speaks louder than death and all the things that threaten to overpower your goodness. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the gift of the church and especially for the gift of this church and its people. We pray for the staff, in the session, and for all those who are tired and weary and worn, and for those who are full of energy and excitement and vitality. Help us to be mindful of those who are in different places than we find ourselves, to greet one another with grace and kindness. When we find ourselves needing to rest and renew, gently lead us beside still waters. Make us lie down in green pastures. Give to us a clear vision and sense of purpose and mission to which you call us now. Through Jesus Christ and the power of your spirit, you have promised to be with us always and in all things. Grant comfort, mercy, strength, and peace to those who face suffering, to those who are grieving, to those who are in pain in body or mind or spirit. Hold before them your promise of joy that will come with the morning. Remind us all of your promise of a new day. For the many blessings of and in our lives, we give you our thanks, for you are our beginning and our end. As we seek to be ever more faithful followers of Christ, hold us close, guide our paths, send us on your way that we might fulfill your purposes for us and all the world. Send us beyond our comfortable circles as we seek to share your hope and vision of a world made new in Christ. We ask all this in the name of our risen Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise and sing our hymn of sending, number 295, verses 1 through 3.
And as we go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with each one of us, those whom we love, and all God's children everywhere. Amen. Amen.